Um, but yeah, welcome. I'm uh, Ian Gardner. Uh, I am your host today. Uh, this is a webinar uh, on purpose, performance and profit, uh, which is a founder and investor lens to understanding the environmental, social and governments, uh, which is ESG uh, imperative. So if you're not sure what that is, don't worry, because we're going to get right into it. Uh, I am uh, one of the co-founders at Innovation Bay. Um, and yeah, let me uh, let me jump into it. I want to start by acknowledging the and paying my respects to the traditional uh, owners of the lands in which we're all gathered today. Uh, I'm in Bondi Junction, so this is part of Gadigal land. So um, I would like to pay my respects to, to their elders, past, present and emerging, uh, and acknowledge, acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Straits Islanders uh, who are here today. A uh, little bit about Innovation Bay. Uh, so if you don't know who we are, um, we are here to support and connect the startup community uh, all across Australia. Uh, we've done a little bit of work in New Zealand too, and uh, hopefully more soon. Uh, we've been doing this since 2003, uh, which is a long time, uh, 18 and a bit years. Uh, and we're all about creating connections and communities between founders, leaders, and investors. So if that is, if you are one of them, you are in the right place. And uh, thank you so much for, for joining. I uh, want to do a big call out to KPMG. Uh, so KPMG's uh, High Growth Ventures. Um, we are partnering with them on this event. Uh, we're going to hear from a couple in their team. Uh, so yeah, the KPMG High Growth Ventures team, we've been working with them. They've been a partner and supporter of, uh, of uh, Innovation Bay for about five years now. Uh, and they're dedicated to helping startup founders achieve sustained high performance and support the whole Australian startup ecosystem. Um, okay, a little bit housekeeping on what we're going to do today. Um, I'm about to invite the, the panel up to the stage uh, and we're going to start the, the conversation. Uh, we do want to hear questions from uh, everyone out there as well. So this, I'd love this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, I think we had about 150 registrations, so hopefully there's a few of you on the, the call here. Uh, but yeah, please do submit your questions in the Q&A, uh, which is a function on Zoom. I'm sure, I'm sure we've all done enough Zoom to know how to operate the Q&A. Uh, it's just down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'll also get the, the, the chat is running, so you can just chat along, tell us where you're from, and let, let's just keep it sensible and, uh, and um, clean. Uh, what are we discussing today? So yeah, we are discussing ESG. So let me actually just kill my screen share so we can... Um, yeah, and I might invite everyone up onto stage just while I'm doing this. Um, yeah, so ESG, uh, I'll welcome Amanda, you're first, Jonathan, uh, who else we've got, Andrew, uh, yeah, Tim, yeah, and there's a few others. So I'll do the intros in, in a sec. Um, yeah, ESG, it's one of the fastest moving market drivers for investors and companies. Uh, and we're going to explore today just how ESG can help you, uh, what effect is it going to have on you, uh, your business, your, your business performance, how are you going to drive profit, and how are you going to affect positive change. You know, so those are all, those are all great outcomes. Uh, now, I can't have this. I, I am self-confessed not an expert in this space, so I'm actually pretty excited about hearing from the, the panel as well. Um, so in no particular order, uh, we have Jonathan Hannum. So welcome, Jonathan. Quick mic check. You all right? Hello. Well, yeah, hi. Good, good stuff. It's always good when the mics work. Uh, Jonathan, you are a co-founder and also the managing director of the Taronga Group, uh, which is a, a venture capitalist. Um, oh, no, sorry, the Taronga Group of companies, but you are the managing partner of Taronga Ventures, which is part of that. Uh, and it's, yeah, you have a real tech ventures fund. Uh, more than 25 years experience in the real estate sector. Uh, and that's one of the leading drivers for, for ESG, which uh, I think we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, Amanda, uh, you've got a very simple bio here. I mean, oh. you've done a lot more than this, but right now I'm you are simple, head of high growth. Woman. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> very complicated woman. <laughs> awesome woman. Uh, yeah, you're the head of high growth ventures at KPMG Australia. Uh, Emerick uh, Madus, uh, welcome along. Uh, Emerick, you are the CEO and founder of Lord of the Trees which is an awesome name for a business, and we'll, we'll get into that. But you are the, the first commercial drone planting scheme for ecosystem restoration using robotics, drones, and AI. So that is wonderful what you're trying to do, and uh, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more about, uh, about that. Uh, Lord of the Trees, part of the solution to the um, ESG challenges that we're facing. Um, all right, look, that's enough for me. Let's, uh, let, let's have a chat about this. So 
Uh, look, we should start with just the, the sort of real high level here and, and maybe try and get a definition of what ESG represents. Um, so why don't I throw to you first, Jonathan, um, and just see if you can set the scene for us around ESG as, as one of the leading proponents, I suppose, in the panel. Thanks, Ian. So um, for us, so uh, we're investing into emerging technology companies that impact the built environment and the real estate sector more broadly. And I guess for us, the um, over the last 12 months, almost all of our investors have started to ask us more about what we're doing with companies that can impact the environment, um, that can have a greater impact on their social, the social needs that we need to address, and also that can help real estate groups with a better understanding of how they can govern their underlying portfolios. So we've sort of, we've hit on the key three E, S and G, but what this really means is, is how can we, I guess, future-proof our businesses, the, the real estate groups, by having technology and innovation that can come in and help to support the change that we need to make across the entire sector. So it is deliberately broad, um, and it is, you know, the real estate sector, as not many people know, but it's one of the greatest polluters in this space. So it's one of the greatest emitters of carbon. Um, but we also have huge challenges with, um, you know, pay disparity, with construction debts. So there's a lot of underlying issues within the real estate sector that can be addressed through a greater understanding of ESG. Yeah. Uh, Amir, let me let me throw to you, and, and maybe you could start your your answer just with a, a quick overview of your very cool Lord of the Trees company and what you're trying to do, uh, and then maybe follow on by saying, you know, how ESG is either benefiting you or how you think about it in a day to day life. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> so it's great to be here. Thanks for having me today. Um, so Lord of the Trees, um, we're just about to celebrate um, our three year anniversary. Um, we are a company that restores ecosystems. So we do full ecosystem restoration using uh, mainly drones, robotics, artificial intelligence, science, and uh, the knowledge of uh, indigenous communities as well. Um, we mainly focus um, at replanting ecosystems after bushfires, for example, um, when the mine is closing. So we do uh, mining rehabilitation and we're just starting to uh, talk as well to farmers. Um, mainly um, work here in Australia, but we do have projects happening uh, overseas as well at the moment. Um, so when it comes to ESG, um, as we've all seen over the last uh, couple of years, the world is changing at an exponential rate and um, the ESG movement has been gaining momentum since its conception. And at Lord of the Trees, we're constantly raising money to grow our business. And we realized very quickly uh, from talking to investors that the need for investing in sustainable practices will only grow as these changes continue to occur, which is what uh, Ian just said. And uh, it's very important to incorporate ESG factors when growing your business. Um, we, we think as well that ESG puts a lot of heavy emphasis on risk management because the monitoring and mitigating risks across all three dimensions, which is uh, environmental, social, and uh, governments, should be an important priority for any company, no matter how big or small. And at the end, it really affects the long-term value of an asset or a business, and uh, it can have a significant impact on society when you consider all stakeholders that are involved. <laughs> so, so is it fair to say that you, you've had inbound, more inbound inquiries as a result of your ability to, to be an ESG, you know, is that, is that a thing? Like, are you ESG sanctioned? Or I mean, what does that actually mean? And why does that mean you get more uh, inquiries from people? No, it's not necessarily, it, it's more like in terms of transparency and what we're trying to communicate that is aligned. It's it's the ethos of, of our business, uh, especially since we are in, um, you know, we're, we're, I mean, especially in our line of business when we're trying to, um, you know, fix the ecosystem and repair the planet. So it's it's very important that we, uh, we breathe uh, ESG in everything that we do. Yeah. Uh, Amanda, let me throw it to you. I mean, like you, you've been working in startups for almost as long as I have, so we've been around for a while. Uh, but the ESG has definitely, you know, I think if you did a Google search from five years ago, it didn't exist. 
Um, and two years ago, a little bit more. Last year, a lot more. And now it's just, it seems to be everywhere. So, uh, I mean, wh why has it become so relevant? And maybe you could sort of cascade into, you know, what it means for KPMG. Sure. Um, well, I'm not going to take you on a bit of a history lesson, Ian, but it has been around. <laughs> history has actually been around. I, I think it actually started, I, I will hazard a guess, in around 2005, because we started to see and hear a little bit more. When I was in the U, I lived in the US in around the GFC around 2008, and you, it was starting to sort of be discussed then. And I think, um, the, yeah, I, I just remember hearing about it. So it sort of, you know, it was getting, and I, and I can imagine it sort of steadily started to sort of increase from there. And then around sort of 2013, 2014, um, you saw another sort of this acceleration in the growth of ESG investing because studies were starting to be published that showed that good corporate sustainability performance was associated with good financial results. So, and then again, over the last couple of years, we saw a real increase in the urgency of ESG investment. And I think, you know, one of the key drivers for that was climate change. Um, and more recently, there was a, a global climate report, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with on the call that, um, I was getting the name, I think it's AR6, AR6, yeah, probably. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know. AR6 I don't found, oh, yeah. <laughs> really found that um, one thing was that global global climate is changing and it's changing rapidly. And two, there's a need to uh, the need to act is now is actually urgent to avoid catastrophic um, climate impact. So um, I think this made the this sort of made the capital markets take notice because it was really saying that climate change is no longer a distant threat on the horizon, but it's one that's here and now, um, and it'll have really a multi-billion dollar economic consequences. If, if, we don't start doing something about it. So I think to me, it's been this sort of long journey that's starting to accelerate. And I think that's really important for this conversation because, you know, we're, you know, this is not going away, you know, and, it, and startups and it, and it is really relevant to startups because they're, you know, they will be asked to start to measure things. And this is already happening in other parts of the world. It's just not here yet. Um, I think the reason that it's, it's super important to KPMG. I mean, we've identified it as a key, globally as a key mega trend. Um, we know it's going to impact all of our clients. It's a space that we have and we'll continue to invest really heavily in it. Um, we've got a global platform called Impact, you know, and that work helps clients achieve the ESG imperatives. We've got an awesome sustainability team here. So you know, we're in it, you know, we're in it, we're right in the thick of it as well and working uh, with many of our clients now here and, and in Australia and also many of our startup clients as well. All right. Now, that was great context from, from everyone. So we'll maybe dig into some of the specifics. So, um, yeah, Jonathan, let's throw to you as the investor on the panel. Uh, and ask you, I mean, how do we phrase this? Like, what ESG lens do you bring um, when you are doing your job? Um, you know, what are the risks? What are the opportunities? Just tell us about the uh, how you're viewing the world through that ESG lens. I think the major lens that we bring is that um, our sort of mandate to invest is, is the function of all of the investors that are supporting us. So um, we have groups like Dexas and Vicinity in Australia and um, some of the you know, more global ones would be groups like PJM Real Estate. Um, so they're massive owners of, of real estate and they are all looking at ways that they can differentiate their own portfolios. And so when that filters down to us as the investor that's representing them, we actively search for global technologies that can actually directly impact their portfolios. So, um, you know, if we think of some of the investments that we've made, and it's probably good to give some sort of examples. So um, we, last year we invested into a business called Carbon Cure, which is um, a Canadian business that has a quite a cool technology that they actually inject carbon dioxide into cement. And it actually creates a stronger product. So you can actually have, um, you can embed the carbon dioxide into the anchor of the building, you know, the in industry that we're all in, that this anchor product can then actually be a positive. So we're, we're turning carbon dioxide into a positive building material. And um, that business is now expanding into Australia, into New Zealand, into Singapore and Japan. So as an example of a business, that's the one that when we present it, it, it gets the most interest because we know that real estate is a big polluter. And if we can start the uh, value chain with a cleaner product, we actually have a chance to deliver some of the overall goals for each of these corporates. So I think that the lens we bring is that it, it needs to be impactful and it needs to be able to be measured. And so when we can actually measure the difference the business um, can make to a big corporate, 
um, that makes it a more interesting investment for us. Yeah, um, well, and, the, and the good thing in that, uh, Jonathan, is it's not just a uh, um, better, I mean, it's a good investment too. I mean, like the product as a result, or, you know, as well as pulling carbon dioxide out of the air is, for, from what you just said, creating a better product. So there is a profit imperative there too, yeah? Yeah, so it's quite interesting. So, so many of the corporate, you know, they, they would like to see um, technology companies that are either at cost or at the same cost as the existing. So it makes it much easier for them to make a switch to a new, new project, product. So in this case, it is actually, it's cost neutral. So it's a, it's a similar cost to, you know, to have a greener, cleaner cement, which um, is making it very attractive. And in that one, we, we co-invested with Microsoft and Amazon, you know, some amazing investors who have all committed to actually use the product. So I think it, as that grows, it will actually become really useful for many of the developers in, in this region. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's a great story. So I appreciate that. But we'll jump back to it. And there's a question actually in the in the chat panel, which uh, is linked to that, but I won't ask it now. I'll come back to it. So uh, Amaric, like you're, you're the founder in here um, and I'm interested a bit more around your, you know, again, we touched on this before, but just a bit more granularity and what your, your ESG priorities are. And if you've got any, you know, to the, to those who are listening, trying to work out, you know, should I change my focus or actually start a focus on, on ESG? Any practical tips for about to them as to how to embed ESG in, in what they're doing? Sure. So for us at Lord of the Trees, the more obvious, um, <clears throat> the three more obvious um, um, that, that we target are number 13, 14 and 15. So obviously climate action, uh, life below water and life on land uh, that are directly linked to um, our, um, um, to, to what we do. But there are things as well. So I always see it almost as an iceberg. There is things that you see at the top and then there are things that you don't really see uh, 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 underneath. And the, the three items that we target are uh, number five, uh, gender equality. So we want to achieve gender equality and empower, um, you know, women um, um, in, in our business. Uh, number eight, which is decent work and economic growth, where, which is about promoting sustainable, inclusive and sustainable economic growth uh, all throughout the projects. And the last one is number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. And at the beginning, when, um, when we started the business three years ago, it felt like it was a big mammoth of, of uh, almost like a whale to, to digest and to be like, okay, what are we going to do and what are the priorities? And I know there are about 50 founders uh, that are listening to us now on the call. And uh, I think my advice to, to those founders would be don't try to start and, and do everything at once because it, it's just not going to work. It's not going to work. And, and it's, it's a pharaonic, it would be a pharaonic thing to want to do everything all at once. Just pick one, uh, go with the low hanging fruits. So for us, it was, um, <clears throat> we started with uh, gender equality and if, you know, that, and in building the team and then go for things, have a plan, do a mapping and say, you know what, in one year, two years or three years, this is where I want to, this is what the goals and then walk your way uh, backwards. That's how it starts. All right. Let's thank you. Uh, let's keep rolling along. Um, Amanda, any from your side, any favorite success story? You know, either from anyone you've worked with, or uh, those that you've met, or heard about founder investor success story. Uh, well, not really. No, I just I think the the thing is it's success. Well, I suppose that what we have done with startups is we there's a an offering we've got called true value and, and what it does is it actually helps um it helps it's sort of what Merrick was saying it really gets in there and actually helps you understand what you need to measure but it doesn't make it huge and I think the success in this is actually being able to start pick yeah. a number of things that you can measure that you can actually find and have access to the data that will help you actually you know measure this ongoingly as well but We've run, you know, we've run companies, a, a couple of startups through that. I don't think, let's say Nexpo is one, I don't think they'll mind me mentioning that. So, you know, their, their whole, one of their missions is, you know, reducing, they have a sugar-free soft drink. So where they want to see what impact it has in the world if, you know, more people drink their soft drink. And so we were actually, we've been able to help them look at how do we actually measure that? Like, how do we measure the impact of that in the world in a way that is 
that is credible um, and, and they can use that with investors and now they're using those numbers with global investors and also how do we do it in a way that's not just a snapshot of one day in time, it's ongoingly measured. So these are the sort of things we've worked. So to me, that's a real success story that if we're putting startups in the world that can go out there and talk now globally and use these measurements, I think that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. No, that's awesome. All right, look, maybe we'll take some questions. There's some great questions coming in. So thank you. And if you have a question, just stick it in the Q&A box. Uh, this is from Vishkan. Um, what, and I'll just read it out. So Vishkan uh, says, what is needed, and this is for you, Jonathan. So what is needed from a policy perspective to encourage more Australian VCs to ingest, uh, to invest in ESG startups? How do you address the debate on sustainability versus profits, especially when traditional metrics are focused on returns for investors? It's a great question. And I think it, um, that actually the market's shifted dramatically. So because global capital is now demanding a greater focus on sustainability, it means that the underlying, so if you think of um, a very straightforward example is in the real estate space, you, know, you can have a, a building that is targeting a certain level of neighbors rating or a you know, green star. And could you justify increasing that and have a tenant pay the difference? That was the big debate. So in the past, we could never prove that a tenant would pay more to move to a greener building. But now we're starting to see that. And we're seeing it, um, it's actually measurable. So we've got a, a great um, example in the US, in New York, MIT has actually done a study of every transaction in New York City from something like 2011 to 2017. And they actually showed that the green, clean, connected building delivered a higher capital return and had a higher rental. And it had a higher rental from a better quality tenant. So it's the first time we can actually prove that sustainability has actually delivered, delivered a, an outperformance at that level. So um, when you start to get those sort of numbers coming through, then capital will actually flow into that space because it is actually delivering a greater profit. So I think, so for, you know, the, the question sort of dropped off, but for many of the key investors in this space, they recognize that. Um, there actually are fantastic financial returns from being the, at the forefront of sustainability. And that's exactly where we're, we're pushing our business. So yeah, and you, just in on that one. Yeah, sorry, you go, sorry, Amanda. I asked Jonathan a question. Like my, we've worked with a couple of uh, the VCs around this already, just to, because it's also not a, it's not an easy thing for VCs to put in place as well. It's actually really, it's like, because I at the beginning, I was like, why doesn't every VC just have this? <laughs> God, so it's like, but it's actually, um, yeah, it's, it's quite a, it's a, it can be a bit of a slippery slope too. What are you measuring? How are you measuring it again? Do you have access to all the data? You know, once you then, you know, if you're out there with those ESG measurements, then the companies you're investing in, how do you, they need to have those sort of measurements as well. And so I just wondered from your side, like you must have implemented it. Like, was it, is it a hard thing to do or what, what was it like for you guys to put it in place? So even um, maybe back even when I was at Mervac, so in 2014, Mervac's policy, we had an announcement of this changes everything, which was actually the first of the big real estate groups to come out with a plan to reach um, a carbon neutral position. Um, and that was in you know, 2014, it was pretty early. Yeah. And even internally at the executive and at the board, it, there was a leap of faith where we had no, uh, no real understanding of how we would go the last sort of you know, five years to get there. But it was a directional positioning of the business that this was important. Right. And so the CEO wanted it, the executive team wanted it, the board demanded it, and that drove an incredible change through the business. So you could actually then start to test and, and even potentially have some of those tests fail, which is something that's quite, you know, in the Australian corporate world, <laughs> Failures are not really accepted in many cases. So that was quite a shift. And we then started to see all of the REITs came up with their plans. And we can say that you know, some of them are a little bit later than others, but um, you know, there is now a clear shift that every group needs to have a clear understanding of the date that they'll get to carbon neutral. And you know, some are even moving to carbon pos positive, but it requires a level of internal commitment that's that's actually the big the biggest first step yeah i mean there's some um some comments coming in the the, the chat room uh, one from louis and one from jeff um 
Yeah, and, and Louis' comment is around BlackRock. I mean, BlackRock is, I think, the world's biggest asset manager, $10 trillion. And uh, Larry Fink, I think it's $10 trillion, uh, but the chairman, Larry Fink, came out and he was saying, fund, yeah, the reshaping finance and putting sustainability right at the center of it. So I don't think you're seeing them where they're divesting all their investments in oil and gas and a few other things. Is, is that right? That's right. So at the moment, there's, um, there's something called the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. And there's about $43 trillion of, of fund managers, including groups like BlackRock, Vanguard, UBS, all the big groups have all committed to this. And it's, it's basically two steps. One is um, a net zero by 2050 at the latest, and also a one and a half degrees reduction in temperature. And so you know, that's sort of, you know, the big groups are moving in that space and that will filter through. I, I, actually, let me follow up with Jeff's question. So Jeff, as well as, uh, being articulate in the chat has put a question in. So thank you, Jeff, and uh, uh, good to see you in the, in the call. Uh, let me just read it out. In a recent AFR article, it was stated that the ASX 200 uh, have trebled, uh, I guess is the, in, in terms of number of companies that are doing this and talking about ESG, but there's still 80% of more than, yeah, 80% of them have yet to adopt a net zero target. Um, so, yeah, Jonathan, I don't, I don't want to, uh, you know, out, outstay our welcome with you, but um, I'll, I'll start with you and then maybe get the other panelists to go. But uh, what are the top drivers to get businesses to adopt this net zero um, target? So we sort of focus on the groups that are investing into those top, you know, ASX 200. So those groups are all demanding it. And um you know, I can sort of speak you know, more directly on the real estate trusts or the listed property groups. Um, they all have strategies in play for this. So um, I think it might be some of the mining and you know, there's, there's other groups, the, the, the heavy industry groups that might struggle in this space. But even in the past weeks, we've seen BHP make incredible commitments and actually complete shifts of their entire business model because they realize that they actually need to change. And that will require them to divest some parts of the business. Um, you know, so that's, it is happening. Uh, and it, I think we need to, it also takes time, right? So this, this is a process that is actually quite difficult to implement. Um, and it takes, so it takes commitment at the highest and senior level, but then it also takes time to implement. Yeah. Uh, Emmerich, let me let me ask you that question too. I mean, you, you must have this discussion with companies all the time, um, maybe. Uh, I mean, just around this net zero and or or, or putting stakes in the ground uh, as a corporate with a strategy as to how to to drive better outcomes. So, like, how are you seeing that? Yeah, look, I think the intent um, <clears throat> more and so we get approached more and more by companies wanting to be you know carbon neutral and. Um, the easiest way for them is, um, or they think that the easiest way is to actually um, uh, plant trees, and that's why they get in touch with us. Um, and in that regards, there's a mix of, um, um, as Jonathan just said, you know, from um, a commitment from the top down, but uh, there's also a mix of pressures from their clients, you know, wanting them to be carbon neutral. Um, in regards to the big corporations, um, you know, I think 2050 is is um, is a long time away. I, 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 we work more. I mean, for us, we have targets that are more at, at around you know 2030, uh, and and these are the targets that we'd like to work with uh, with clients. Um, one thing as well, which we are very mindful of, is greenwashing. So we've been approached. I've got a I've got a, a perfect case, example. We were approached very recently by a company. Um, who makes um, uh, food products and the, the approaches, they wanted us to plant some trees to offset some of their uh, uh, you know, emissions to be carbon neutral. And when we asked them what was the, you know, we wanted to find out what were the reasons uh, behind um, what they wanted to do, because they were very insisting on um, uh, uh, for us to plant trees in India to protect the tigers or something to do with uh, chimpanzees. And round turns, and I couldn't understand. We just couldn't. I couldn't grasp why why they were so insistent on us uh, going into the landscape. And it's simply because on two of their products, um, they had uh, a drawing of a tiger, um, uh, and then a drawing of a chimpanzee. And um, 
what we did is we actually send them um, a questionnaire that we do with uh, all of our clients and uh, asking them a bit more information, you know, just to really check their credentials. And uh, we didn't hear back from them. So it's the perfect example of a story where uh, we try to prevent greenwashing. You know, we don't want them to be, I mean, for us, it's a brand thing as well. We don't want companies to approach us um, just for the sake of planting trees and, and using that as an example, when, um, as Jonathan and Amanda clearly said earlier, one thing which is really important when you when you take that route, a, it takes time, and the reason why it takes time, especially with your carbon emission, is you have to do an audit, right? So there's no point of wanting to do ESGs uh, if it's to continue and do business as usual where and and think you're doing the right thing simply because you're planting trees so you have to look at what you're doing first and how you can improve that before trying to look for solutions such as planting trees yep. um, yeah uh, amanda what about you i mean like you're talking to clients all the time and i'm sure a lot of your team are too i mean how are you talking to them about setting targets and trying to drive to um you know this net zero yeah, well, I don't, uh, to be honest, they, I think this whole, you know, we're just focused on startups and I still, I think there's startups in certain areas like America that are further ahead, but generally what we're finding is, you know, we're not really there yet. There seems to be, you know, there's still, the, the reason I did sort of go on that bit of a rant around the issues we've here for a while is because we do get asked a lot, is it new? And and we're like, no, it's it's it, this is a force and it's coming. <laughs> And, and you've got to be prepared for it. And so I suppose we're not so much really, I don't feel we're even having those conversations yet. It's more around really trying to get people, get startups to understand the importance of it and what it would be like to measure it. And, you know, we're sort of, we're lucky we're at a time where I think, you know, technology, you know, the, our ability to gather and process data is becoming easier and cheaper. So we can actually get the data. Often we can get, we can get more data now than we could before to help sort of, um, to support the the metrics, if you like, so there's there's opportunities to do this in easier ways than there has been. Um, and I think our conversations are mainly around: Are you thinking about it? Can we help you with it? You know, we've done some great work with um, Taronga. I think you know one of the things we've we're in partnership with Taronga Ventures as well uh, for many years. And you know, one of the things we love about it is they work with our sustainability team for their um, when they run their programs, their acceleration programs for sort of later stage or it's later stage sort of companies really. Uh, in the prop tech space predominantly and they run them through all of them through ESG workshops that we run for them and I think that's you know we we're, I suppose we're operating more at that space we're really trying to get the education out and work with different partners to do that so we can reach as many startups as possible yeah no that's great um all right let, let me let me there's another great question just coming from uh, Vishkan so let me just jump to that and then we'll jump back to some of the other ones so um this is for you Jonathan um to achieve net zero targets and improve ESG credentials should companies, uh, I guess investors, he's saying, divest from heavy emitters or continue investing in them to support the transition? Well, I guess that this might be for companies that have set a target and you know kind of want to do that. Should you support them or just say, not your 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 bad news, we're out? I think that transition period has to be addressed. So, um, and that, that's, if you can address the transition, then the political, I guess, um, the lack of political will to motivate change in this space could also be addressed. Um, so if you think of you know, closing coal mines or um, closing some of the industries that are heavy polluters, um, I think we, we have to have that lens of you know, how do we tra transition this um, and make sure that the workforce that is working in that space can actually be retooled and reskilled. So um, I think the capital that's backing these businesses understands that there is going to be that transitional period. And, um, but it is a, you know, this isn't, the, the, there's a financial imperative here. But um, so I, my brother's actually the um, Sydney Morning Herald carbon editor. And we were telling on the weekend and we were sort of talking about, you know, we're in this COVID bubble at the moment. Everybody's talking about COVID, but we've just had some of the worst reports regarding our climate that we could ever have expected. Um, in 10 years' time, are we going to be looking back at this period and thinking we missed the opportunity? And you know, in his position, it's, it's clear. Um, you know, we have to be doing much more in this space. I think institutional capital is now backing that transition. And um, you know, we see it, we actually see it as a massive opportunity for Australia and Australian founders. Mm. Um, we can actually 
we should be at the forefront of the space. Yeah. And there is now capital that can support this. And there are, you know, huge, hugely competitive global industries that, that can support this change. So yeah. Um, and I think the responsibilities on, on us as investors and as startups and as uh, you know, the private sector, I mean, the, the government, especially the, the, our current government, and they're, they're just so tied up in their internal wrangling and this love for fossil fuels and coal that they're just unable to do anything. And I think we just got to accept that uh, and try and get on with it as a, as a community ourselves. Um, and I think that's why most of us are here. Um, all right, let's keep going with the questions. There's some good ones coming in. We've got uh, you know, another 15 minutes or so before we have to start wrapping. So uh, one for you, um, Emmerich, uh, from Pierre again. So where do regulatory processes uh, sit in this big picture? So I guess it is throwing back to government. Um, and then, yeah, same for ethics and same for B Corps. Yeah, so like, yeah, do it, yeah. Yeah, it's, that to you. it's very interesting because we're actually going, so we're going through this process to be um, um, certified with B Corp. Um, and you really have two things you have, and, and, and Pierre, I don't know which uh, industry you work in, but you do have um, um, mandatory um, uh, processes, right, in each industry. Um, that uh, so it's part of the regular regulatory process and on the other hand you have voluntary reporting um, uh, such as the one that we do when you engage with B Corp um, so it's really the commitment as a founder it's how much commitment or how committed are you um, and and where do you want to position your company uh, in that regards and and what are you trying to achieve by doing that so for us it's about uh, uh, two things it's mainly it's about transparency uh, it's about the health of the planet obviously but the the the, um, the ecosystem um, of our employees and the stakeholders that that we deal with uh, every day yeah. All right, great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Pierre, for, for that question. And look, keep the questions coming in. Um, um, yeah, look, let's ask something slightly different. So, I mean, ESG is the, is the topic. Uh, and I think we focus mostly on the E, you know, the environmental side of the, the S and G, but we probably should talk about the S and G. So the, uh, yeah, I mean, let me throw that to, to you, Jonathan, um, to answer that. So, yeah, social and governmental. Um, what what more should we be thinking about? I think um, in this space, where the sort of social and governance aspects of this. So, um, we see incredible benefits in the digitalization of you know construction and data and information regarding assets that can actually lead to a much greater control of governance. Um, so it's that reporting element that has actually been missing. Um, so you know, if we think about tools, we have been actively le looking for businesses that can provide us with the tools to help with that reporting. Because uh, many of these real estate groups, they spend a lot of time actually, you know, asset by asset trying to deliver a sensible report. And I think one of the messages in the chat was, you know, how do we, should this be audited? How do we actually get an independent measure in this space? Um, and that's, you know, we have, the focus for many groups is on that sort of sustainability to begin with, but then as they progress and as they mature, they actually move more into the social and governance aspects. So um, yeah, it is, that is actually from a deal sort of point of view, we see a lot of companies that are now targeting that space. And so founders that are potentially, you know, they've been working in these, these sectors and they realize that the reporting is a bit of a nightmare if they can create a tool that can help that or you know, a system, it can actually lead to quite an interesting investable company. Yeah. And, and Amanda, do you want to touch on the, the, the tracking and the tools to, to do all of this stuff? I mean, I think there are some uh, initiatives at KPMG, aren't there? Yeah. Um, so there is. I mean, again, you know, we all said it, it can be tricky and, and all that sort of stuff. But I, I think, you know, actually it was, I think it was like two years ago at Venture Down Under in when... <laughs> The, which is the Innovation Bay day for or weekend away or whatever for uh, the VCs. And it, and it, that's when it really, they started to talk about how difficult it was for VCs and companies to measure ESG. Um, and then last year, this year, was it this year? This year it happened again and the same conversation came up and we'd started to think about, oh, it is really hard. And how, how, what, how, what could we do to actually help startups like measure it easily? I saw in the chat there, I think from Jeff saying that, 
you know, companies I speak with for ESG advisory is expensive and, and yeah, I think it has, it has been, and it is in some cases, but so we were like, well, what if we were to put a tool in for, or develop a tool for startups that, and, and also be able to help them identify the, what they should be measuring, because that's part of the problem as well. And so we sort of put that out as a bit of a challenge for us. We have worked with a company, a Australian startup, is, which is awesome, called Social Suite. We've sort of, what we've done is combine our advisory with the tool. And so, and we've, this is sort of a, an initiative that we're, we're running at the moment. Um, it basically, what, what I think someone's going to send out, maybe Claire in the chat, there's a page that you can register if you're interested in it. And what it is, is we set you up on the tool and then we have two workshops with our sustainability group and they help the founders actually identify what they should be measuring, how they can measure it. And so it's a, it's a minimal cost, something we've invested in to cover it with, there is limited numbers. I think it's like 60 or something like that. I don't know what it is actually, but I know it's not endless, but we're doing it. And it's, again, we're, we're just trying to do it to see if we can provide this as an opportunity for just more founders to get in the space and start taking those steps towards ESG management. So I think we're going to send something to everyone that was on here anyway, but yeah, there's going to be a link that will be sent out that all you have to do is go to the page, just put your name in and then KPMG will contact you and sort of talk to you about what can be done in that sort of yeah, great. Yeah. And we're always like, we're the team and I actually, it's a space that everyone's, you know, super passionate about. So we're always keen to talk to anyone about and see if we can help in any way. Um, there's a link question from that. It looks like from one of your colleagues, Amanda Anastia. Um, and she's asking like, is he, are ESG metrics going to be audited in the future? In the same way. Not, not one of my colleagues because they wouldn't have asked such a hard question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, will it be audited? I would think it. I mean, I can't. I, I'm not an auditor, as you know, but I. Uh, I, I Future think career. I, <laughs> I think that yeah. I mean, look, the regulations. We we want to avoid this sort of greenwashing, and I think that you know we have to find a way of regulating the numbers and making them credible and all that sort of stuff. So I, I would assume that's where we're going with it. It makes sense to me. That's where we'd be going, but. Yeah, again, I, I wouldn't take my word for it. But it, need, right. it needs to be standardized because then you can compare across, yeah. um, not just across countries, but there, there are tools that, you know, there's global benchmarks that people yeah. you know, sign up to and, and they do deliver that level of sort of standardized reporting. But who, who's going to standardize it? Are a bunch of accountants going to get together or is it the ESG investors? I mean, who's going to fix this? Jonathan? But, um, there is some of the groups that are doing the benchmarks are not for profit, and some there's quite a few that are for profit. So there is a you know, there's a navigation there, um, but there is a proliferation of companies focused yeah. on. And I think um, Mary, you mentioned you were looking. I mean, you know, social suite is the one we looked and we we decided to go sort of with that one. But I think you mentioned that you were looking into a few others as well. So there's obviously other tools. Yeah, yeah, they are different tools. So we looked at uh, one called uh, Fitch. Uh, there's another one called Sustainalytics, Proof of Impact, DGNX. Um, yeah, so we're looking at all of these at the moment. In terms of budget, um, as a founder, it's something you're going to have to account for. Like, um, but I don't see that as a cost. I really see it as an investment. And uh, to answer. Um, there's a question in the chat now from Mark, um, who's asking um, for startups um, if uh, that will add a, a premium on their valuations. My feeling, uh, and it's only coming from a founder's side of view, I, I would say yes. And this is why we're investing uh, in, in tools like that, you know, to make it happen. Um, uh, just because we know that on the other side of the fence, uh, we have, you know, a, a people and companies like Ian and Jonathan that are looking for, uh, you know, to invest in companies that are doing the right thing. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. We've got time for probably two or three more. So um, yeah, let's take another question from Jeff. So Jeff, you're on fire with the questions in chat. So thank you. Uh, and this is uh, for you, Amerik. Uh, and, you know, if you could just touch on the, the carbon offsets, so carbon pricing, uh, whether it's a barrier and where you think that's going to go. Yeah, well, the price of carbon is only going to go up. So um, at, at Lord of the Tree, we only really work with two, uh, two carbon markets, uh, mainly. Um, the first one is gold standard. The second one is Vera. Um, the price of carbon two year, uh, sorry, two weeks ago was $21 a ton. Last week on Friday, it was $22 a ton. 
and um, it's expected to um, tip over $35 a ton by the end of this decade. So it's only going to go up. And as a, a startup, if you want to do the, you know, if you want to decarbonize and, and look into carbon credits, as I said earlier, you don't have to do it all at once. You just take uh, one side of your business or, or, or one department and you just start like this, start little. You don't have to decarbonize the entire company um, um, right from the beginning. And I'm going to ask a selfish question because you know, we've seen a few startups coming in um, around that carbon pricing piece. Like, Where is the best place to learn? Because I don't know much about it and just how the whole global carbon pricing model works. Like, Can you give me a reference or us all a reference point for that? Yeah, Google would be the best place. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, uh, so the, in, w when it comes to carbon and carbon credits, we have our own uh, uh, experts in the team. Uh, and you realize as soon as you start talking carbon that it is um, you're opening Pandora's box and it's a never ending, um, you know, rabbit hole and you can go as deep as you want and it can get very complex as well. But um, I would recommend uh, looking at, uh, especially here in Australia, the gold standard that have a very good um, um, very good resource library that explains, um, um, you know, how carbon credit yeah. 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 All right. Awesome. Uh, well, time for a couple more. Uh, uh, let me throw them on this uh, this one to you, Jonathan. It's from Mark. Um, are you seeing ESG focused startups uh, running at any premium in the valuation? So, you know, a company like Amerix, for example, like, do you pay more as an investor for someone with uh, ESG credentials? So, um, yeah, it's a great question. I think the um, it's probably not that we get a higher valuation that going into it. I think it just makes it more attractive to become an investment. Um, and so we're not an impact fund, but we have you know, the majority of our investments are in that sort of ESG space, but it does make it more likely that it would process, go through the process of having investment if it does address or have some impact on ESG. Um, and that in time will mean that there will be obviously valuation uplift because there'll be more, there'll be it'll be more attractive to more investors. So I think at this stage, it's maybe it just makes it more attractive. And then you know, in the next sort of couple of years, um, maybe to Amerix's point as well. So Europe is way ahead on this. You know, the, um, if you think of some of the in July, we had the carbon border adjust, adjustment mechanism, the CBAM, come in, and that's got in its documentation carbon pricing at forty four euros and then up to eighty eight euros per ton. So it's a mechanism to basically, if you're coming in from a country that doesn't have a clear um, hub policy, then it's basically an additional cost for operating in Europe that is imposed. Okay. So um, yeah, but back to the question, I think it is, it, it will make it more attractive in time. Yeah. All right. Uh, the time for a few more. The good thing is um, there were some, a bunch of questions came in uh, during the registration. So I might jump to one of them. Uh, let me take this one from Tom Pascarella. Hey, Tom, how are you, mate? Um, is there a list of avowed ESG investment funds? So if someone wants to invest in a fund, for example, and they want this focus, where would they go? Jonathan. Um, I haven't seen a list of the funds, but I think, um, yeah, um, I think you could look in Australia, a number of the ESV CLPs, so the, the registered early stage venture capital limited partnerships, which is what we are. Um, they, there is a website on the Innovation Australia um, website that has the list of companies and what they're investing into. Um, and globally, I guess it's, yeah, uh, as I'm working, it's probably Google, but um, I haven't seen a dedicated list of, of funds. Yeah. Uh, all right, there's another question from Wendell uh, from Tidal. So, uh, hey, Wendell. Um, this is probably for you, Emmerich. Uh, you know, and look, you can go back to your experience just as you've grown up as a business. Uh, have your needs and the way you've thought about ESG different differed as you've grown? So, like when you were tiny, you know, just the idea versus when you had, you know, just you and a handful of staff versus where you are now versus what you think you're going to be as you're getting bigger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we started with things that are, um, I, I'm going to say, free and, and don't cost a lot of money, such as, um, you know. Uh, gender equality, for example, in the workforce, you know, things like that that are easy to implement. Um, and then we moved on to things that require a bit more um, hands-on 
Um, and in that regard, especially when it comes to um, uh, our environmental impact, we are uh, creating a new post, a new role uh, within the business, which is going to be an impact manager that will just look after that. So um, it, the role of this person will be to look at every single aspect of our business and see how um, it creates a positive or negative impact, record it, and then act accordingly moving forward. So you just have to do it uh, step by step. Yeah, that's what I would suggest. All right, no, that's great. Um, all right, well, look, I think we're at a natural pause in the question. So I, I might say thank you to the audience for all those questions. I, I do have one last one, which I'd love a quick response from, from each of the panelists on. Um, and that, you know, it's really what's next. Uh, I mean, we talked about how ESG has, I know it's been around for a long time, Amanda, but it's definitely more front of mind for everyone now. Uh, but, you know, where are we going in the next five, 10 years? Uh, and let's, let's go, Jonathan, Emmerich, and then Amanda can have the last word. Okay. So perhaps what's next? I mean, for us, we, we announced in June a complete refocusing of our business to be, um, to, to focus on ESG impact as an investing sort of strategy. Um, and I think a little bit, when we began our business, we had a sort of philosophy about what we wanted to do and how we wanted to you know, change the world and, and actually create a better built environment. Um, and we see that the ESG component of that is, is just an absolute driver. Um, and I think we, we are not waiting for government. We're just getting on with it. And we're going to be investing, you know, hopefully many hundreds of millions of dollars in this space. So um, if you have a, you know, founders that are out there, if you have a business that is in the E, S or G, we'd be delighted to talk to you and, and to work with you on your journey. I think that's probably good for me. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, Emerick, where is it going? Uh, yeah, well, look, uh, as a founder, I think more and more we'll hear, or, you know, ESG is going to be part of um, you know, daily talks for any founder, and it, it's going to be a more important component to anyone's journey. Um, from a personal point of view, I think that globally, um, it's better to have millions of companies that are doing their bit, even if it's not perfect, as opposed to just a few thousand companies that are doing the ESG perfectly. So just, just have a go, just try. It's not, you know, it's, uh, you know, how do you eat an elephant just one bite at a time? And I think yeah. that's, that's uh, what I would like to say. Uh, Amanda, last word with you. Like, where, where do you think this is going? Doing this well? Sorry. Where do you think it's going? Oh, where do you think it's going? Um, oh, well, it's, I mean, I just think, as I said before, I think it's just getting the awareness will build. There'll be a greater push for people to um, sort of implement ESG measures, which is great. And I think, I just think in its simplest form, like it's so important because all businesses, startups, they have an impact on the environment, on society. And to me, that means we have a responsibility to ensure that the, the impact is doing more good than bad. So it's really around, you know, businesses have to do good and they have to be good. And I think is if it's seen that way and just simply, and that's what the ESG measurements are, are really helping us to understand and to make sure that, that, that what, the way that you're turning up in the world and running your teams and running your business is actually doing more, more good than harm. And I think where I see it for us is that we want to help as many startups as we can get these in place and make it as easy and as inexpensive as they can. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think that's sort of the, the big push. And so, you know, again, just to sort of plug our initiative, um, it is a great opportunity just to, for founders just to get on there. It's not a, we're not, this is not a revenue generating exercise from us. We genuinely want to get some farmers started and see what we can do if we get so 60 plus on this platform and, and get moving. I think that's a really great start. So, and a really good start for Australian founders. And I think we've all said sort of a little bit on the call that we, we feel maybe there's a, it's not complacency. I just don't think we're sort of getting the sense of urgency around this. And so our agenda is to sort of push the awareness and urgency. Yeah. And Amanda, I think, you know, I wanted to look, I think we are at time here, but uh, I did want to throw to you um, to talk about that opportunity. Is, is that the same one, Amanda, or was that yes. something else? Yeah. yeah. So they'll say, yeah, we'll send out the link to everyone that's yeah, on the great. call. And, yeah. And you just read yeah. Well, it sounds terrific and, and very worthwhile. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, we are going to finish uh, on time. Uh, which I always pride myself in doing, but uh, I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot from that. So um, Jonathan, Amanda, Emmerich, uh, well done with everything you're doing. Uh, and, and thanks for the support of us. Uh, and thank you everyone for, for coming along. I thought the, uh, the chat and the questions were awesome. So thanks for, uh, for 
participating. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. But well done. Uh, well done, okay. team. Thanks, guys. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.